It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague here at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Dr. Thomas Woods. Uh, Tom is a New York Times best-selling author, an author of a dozen books? That's ten. Ten. <laughs> Double digits. <laughs> He's fast. Um, including, of course, Meltdown, Nullification, and a lot of other favorites out there in the audience. And tonight he's going to talk to us on doing economic history. Tom Woods. <laughs> hey. This podium is so big, it's just really, <laughs> really weirdly alienating to be stuck behind it. So uh, I've got my glasses off, so that means I don't have any idea who's in the room, except I think that's Herbener back there. How many times have you heard this talk? You can't be here, all right? You have to go somewhere else. All right. No, he intimidates me, right? He knows too much. All right, anyway. Um, when I've spoken on this subject in the past here, I've taken up the full time. This time... We had a slightly late start because of the technical thing downstairs. We got this repaired. But I'm going to try to, this time, I'm going to try to sort of breeze through some things so that we'll have a little time for questions and also to find out if there actually are any historians, budding historians here, to find out what it is you're working on, what you're up to. Because we have lots and lots of economists now, but fewer and fewer historians working in our tradition, I find. I mean, hardly any, hardly anyone, it seems like. Uh, David Beto had an agonized blog post uh, some time ago saying, what the heck happened to all the historians? It's like me and some other guy, and that's it. So, you know, it is a venerable old discipline. You know, it's way older than economics. It's, you know, kind of cool, too, right? I mean, you know, there are certain suppressed truths in history, too. It's not just economics, so anyway. All right, anyway, that's my crummy pitch for history. What I want to do is start off, and I want to actually say a few things about praxeology, to make sure we all fully get what this thing is, because it is relevant to this issue of doing economic history. So when we talk about the Austrian method of praxeology, we're talking about a, a non-empirical approach to understanding truths that, are, that hold generally in all times and places. And of course you know about the action axiom that human beings act and they have ends and they use means to, uh, to attain these ends. But what I, I just want to take a couple minutes to sort of follow this now a few steps and see where this actually gets us. I mean, this isn't just some kind of trivial observation. We, we actually make progress. We acquire knowledge when we unpack the implications of this. So, for example, so when we act, we are necessarily engaged in some choice. There are all kinds of things I could do. There are all kinds of ends I could pursue, but I'm choosing this particular one. My time, my resources, and even my own body are scarce. And so by acting, I am necessarily choosing among alternative employments of these things. And the very act of choice implies the concept of cost. So we see that economic concepts can be discovered when we analyze the implications of human action. Because when I choose to do one thing, I necessarily must forego some alternative. Um, now, the fact that in acting, um, I have to go forego alternatives. Because I'm doing A, I can't do B at the same time and with the same resources. This implies that I have an ordinal ranking of ends, that, that because I'm choosing this rather than that, this implies there is a this and a that. And this is revealed in action. So the available choices that I forego are naturally ranked lower on my value scale than the choice I, in fact, pursue. And, of course, I pursue my most highly valued end. This is sort of tautological. And if that pursuit should, for whatever reason, become impossible, I will then pursue my second high, most highly valued end and so on. Now, from this, from this alone, we can begin to understand the law of diminishing marginal utility. And all we have to do is make this, this derivation explicit. So the law itself is stated simply enough, the marginal utility of each additional unit of, of, a, of the, of the uh, homogeneous supply of a good decreases as the supply of units increases. Well, this conclusion follows from these basic points that we've made just, just now. Because in line with my ordinal ranking, I will put the first unit of a good toward the satisfaction of my most urgent need. So the second unit, therefore, has to be desired less insofar as it will satisfy a need felt not as urgently as that to which the first unit was directed. 
and additional units being valued for still less urgent purposes will be valued correspondingly less. And then, you know, we, of course, we can go through examples of this, and, you know, it could be units of wheat, and I use the first one to eat, and whatever, the units of water, I drink with the first one, I bathe with the second one, I, you know, I wash my, uh, whatever, my turkey with the third one, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, and, and, you know, and so on and on, and so if I lose one unit, uh, well, this is all just, this is all derivable from the idea of value scales, which, which uh, implies costs, which comes in, show, I mean, all these things direct us immediately back to human action itself. And then this information helps us to derive the supply and demand curves that we see in, in economics. We'll just, just take it to the demand curve and just stop there. But the law of marginal utility states that a person's demand for a particular good is going to decrease with each additional unit because each additional unit is going to be directed to a less valued end. And so it follows that it's only at lower and lower prices that you'll be willing to acquire more units of the good. And, and in fact, the more money you spend on the good, the greater the marginal utility of the lesser cash reserves that you now have remaining to you. And this factor uh, likewise contributes to the decreasing desire of additional units of the good, because you now value your remaining cash all the more. So an individual's demand curve for a particular good must therefore be downward sloping to the right. So that is, as the quantity of goods he acquires increases, the price he is willing to pay declines. The curve depicting total demand for this good as the summation of the demand curves of all individuals must itself be downward sloping to the right. So there's no need for us to go out and test this to see if, well, gee, do demand curves really operate this way? Because this is just derived from truths that we can, we can perceive as, being, as, as generally holding. So this is not a matter of, of psychology. It's not a matter of physiology that, you know, I, I eat a lot of ice cream and then I get full. It, it follows directly from the logic of, of choice. So this is where you can start to go, and then you can continue this reasoning and, and go farther and farther, but that's basically what we're up to with, with, with praxeology, and you can sort of understand that once you, once you see this, you realize that history can be useful as an illustration of certain principles, but it's not like historical data could make me reverse my view and make me think that demand curves could slope the other way. Like this, this, is, this, uh, this is impossible. Now, it's only in the 20th century in the United States that, and by the way, when I was just giving you that rendition, that actually comes from my book, The Church and the Market, which is available for sale here in the bookstore, that little praxeological rendition. Just thought I would point that out. Um, it was in the 20th century that we start to see the history profession in the United States become a profession instead of the avocation that would be pursued by dilettantes. And the process of professionalization in my opinion, was really a process of, of erecting barriers to entry to make non-historians or non-credentialed historians seem sort of unreliable and, and really kind of amateurish because they don't have the secret tools that the rest of us have. And I, I rather suspect this is because so-called professional historians are envious of journalists and amateurs who write best-selling books and most professional historians never write a best-selling book, and they're deeply envious of people who do, so they erect these barriers to entry to say, well, you don't have the training, the, the, his, the, the historian's craft that you need to have. Look, I, you know, I went through all this. I, I have three graduate degrees in history, and there ain't no tools for the historians. This is just a big smoke screen. This is just a snow job, okay? There, there ain't no such thing. I mean, just use common sense, right? You know, you want, to, you want to write a biography of somebody? Find his manuscript collection. Find his letters. Go read them, etc. Don't believe everything you read. I mean, a lot of these principles you can see as far back as Herodotus and Thucydides. I mean, this is just old-timey common sense. So don't feel like you can't write history because you don't have a degree in history. Don't, don't give these people the satisfaction, okay? Don't let them win. Well, one of the principles that the professional historian was expected to adhere to was, of course, impartiality, right? He stands above partisan squabbling. He's going to give you the real truth, right? I mean, the unvarnished data. He's just going to give it to you. And, of course, historians have done such a wonderful job of living up to that, that principle, right? But some people, I think, took this principle, which is fine in and of itself. I mean, you, you shouldn't be one-sided in your presentation. But some took this to the extreme 
of arguing that one ought to go into the study of history without any preconceived notions whatsoever. That you ought to imitate what they understood to be the teaching of Francis Bacon. That you just go out there and you gather empirical data and you look at it and you wait for things to jump out at you. And you just, you approach the, your object of study without any preconceived ideas and you're just content to consult empirical data and observation as unmediated raw material. So, but as I say, some of them are going to the extreme of expressly disavowing all preconceived ideas, including any theoretical apparatus. And so one such scholar argued that uh, we ought to criticize the practice of beginning the examination of historical facts with any theory of interpretation. He argued instead that the simple but arduous task of the historian was to collect facts, view them objectively, and arrange them as the facts themselves demanded. And he went on to say that an honest and competent historian was capable of producing a record of facts that, when justly arranged, interpret themselves. Well, Ludwig von Mises had rather a different view, of course. Mises, in fact, believed that no record of facts, no matter how judiciously arranged, can interpret itself. Mises wrote, history cannot be imagined without theory. The naive belief that, unprejudiced by any theory, one can derive history directly from the sources is quite untenable. No explanations reveal themselves directly from the facts. Mises is what we sometimes call a methodological dualist, which is a fancy way of saying that he believed that investigative methods that would be appropriate for the physical sciences may not in fact be and usually are not appropriate for the study of man. Now, for one thing, there are many reasons for that, but one reason for this is that the historian does not in fact have the tools, a social sciences, scientist does not have the tools the hard scientist has in the sense that he doesn't have a laboratory, he doesn't have laboratory environment in which he can hold one thing, or uh, he, can, he can vary one variable, hold everything constant and examine the effects of just one factor. He doesn't have the ability to do this. He can't isolate one factor and examine its, its effects. You have a, a crisscrossing jumble of factors that are operating simultaneously, and some of them are amplifying others, some of them are working at cross-purposes with each other. So it's impossible uh, to, in effect, act like a physicist when you're a historian or, or an economist. So Mises writes, Historical experience is always the experience of complex phenomena, of the joint effects brought about by the operation of a multiplicity of elements. And so he goes on to say, the pure fact, and he puts pure fact in quotation marks, is open to different interpretations. These interpretations require elucidation by theoretical insight. Now this, of course, flies in the face of the, the German historical school, which you've heard mentioned so far, and other positivists before and since. These people denied that there were laws of economics or laws in the social realm that transcended time and place, that, that rather all we could do was to be content to look at contingent relations that seemed to hold in particular circumstances. So they despaired of discovering a universal kinds of laws of the sort that Mises posited. So Mises and the praxeologists are in fact arguing that there are certain laws that are absolutely true and that are not subject to revision or rejection on the basis of historical data and which in any event the, these data in fact involve the, con the confluence of a multiplicity of events. Now economic theory, says Mises, is the indispensable tool for the grasp of economic history. Economic history can neither prove nor disprove the teachings of economic theory. It is, on the contrary, economic theory which makes it possible for us to conceive the economic facts of the past. So that is to say, you've got a lot of data, but they don't just jump out at you what it means and, and what, what things are merely correlated with, with each other, what things actually cause each other. Well, this you can't know unless you approach your, your object of study with some theory. Now, sometimes there have been some good translations of Mises, very elegant. Other times there have been more awkward and cumbersome and workmanlike translations. 
but, and I don't know who the translator was of this particular passage, so I hope it's like nobody in the room or something, and then I'll feel kind of, kind of bad. But one of my favorite words uttered by Mises of all time, of course, he's uttering this in German, where you can get away with long words. That's like, that would be half the language, is like long, just, and just build them longer. Just shove another word on the end and smash it together, and it's a new word. Well, Mises is referring to this idea of approaching history without any theory to help you understand what's going on. And he refers to this as presuppositionlessness. <laughs> that's, that's sweet, baby. That's good. So Mises writes, and this is from 1929, Nowadays, the economic historian seeks to emancipate himself from theory altogether. He disdains to approach his task with the logical tools of a developed scientific theory, and prefers to content himself with the small measure of theoretical knowledge that today reaches everyone through the newspapers and daily conversation. And now here it is, get ready. The presuppositionlessness of which these historians boast consists in reality in the uncritical repetition of eclectic, contradictory, and logically untenable popular misconceptions, which have been a hundred times refuted by modern sciences. Well, Mises was fond of citing uh, the example of people in Grand Central Station coming and going. If you were standing there observing a typical day in the life of Grand Central Station in New York, you'd see a lot of people going a lot of different places, and it would seem to make no sense at all. You'd say, well, this is just a complete chaos of events. You know, I, it's hopeless to make sense of it. But when you apply a kind of a theoretical lens to what it is that you're seeing, when you realize that the people whose movements you're tracking, these people have ends and that you can actually figure out what many of them are. A lot of these people are simply going to work in the morning and returning from work at night. And then you look at it and suddenly this crazy quilt of events makes sense. Well, that, that's Mises' analogy for how theory enlivens history. Theory makes history understandable, makes it coherent, allows it to, in fact, tell a story rather than just simply be a sterile catalog of discrete occurrences. Now, some level of rudimentary theory, uh, even if at times only a basic understanding of cause and effect relationships, is always necessary for the historian. Because technically, history involves everything that's ever happened. So for number one, you're going to have to discriminate among all events that have ever occurred, which ones are relevant. And you're also going to have to know Causal relationships, if, if you think A causes B when in fact A inhibits B, you're going to do a really crummy job writing the history of A and B. Like, so there are certain things that you have to know before you can tell uh, a, a sensible historical tale. Now, when we apply this to American history, which is the, my own area of study, we can immediately see, starting in the colonial period, what a help it is having a background in Austrian economics. In fact, I once wrote a paper on the subject of what Austrian economics can teach historians. And one thing is, if you study colonial history, you find there are, there's a lot, of, a lot of complaints about an alleged scarcity of money. There's a scarcity of money, so we need inflationary paper money. We've got to have this paper money, or otherwise commerce is going to grind to a halt. Well, you can, can look at that a little more critically when you kind of understand the Austrian understanding of money, and you, you begin to wonder, well, gee, now why would these people, what would somebody have to gain by going around claiming we need a sort of irredeemable paper money in order to facilitate commerce? And it's not always as blatant as Benjamin Franklin when it, it turns out that Franklin's print shop was going to get the contract to print the money. So naturally, he comes out all in favor of the virtues of paper money. It's not always that blatant, but typically you find that it's not merely that these people have the the, uh, the good of society at heart and, and, and it involves the introduction of paper money, you begin to be, you look at things with a more critical eye. Whereas most American historians just read, well, gee, people in the newspapers were saying they really needed paper money, so I guess they did. And that's, they just leave it at that. I mean, where's your, where's your critical apparatus? Well, Austrian school gives you that. Uh, also, also, of course, there's the theory of the business cycle. Well, this is great for a historian. Now, I don't want to mention names. I think I've already mentioned this name in a previous talk that you can find on Mises.org, because so it's probably too late. I should just come right out and mention it. But I feel sorry. Like, he's a nice guy. But my dissertation advisor was a professor of history. 
He was the provost at Columbia uh, for a number of years. He just published a book on uh, Henry Luce, who's the publisher of the Time Life magazines. And so now I'm giving you more and more clues. He was the son of a, of a newsman named David Brinkley. <laughs> His first name was Alan. But Brinkley, I'm oh, sorry, this guy. I was sitting there auditing his undergraduate course one day on, I think it was U.S. History 1900-1945. And he got to the time, he got to the Great Depression. And he gave various competing theories uh, with regard to the, the cause of the Depression. So he went and talked about uh, underconsumptionist theories and uh, talked about, he even went, he even got to the point, he talked about uh, Milton Friedman. And he even went to the point of, he, he talked about Jude Winiski, who was, I mean, it was a Basically a good guy, but he's not a high-powered theorist or anything. I mean, he was one of the architects of the Reagan tax cuts, and he'd written a little book that more or less blamed everything on taxes and tariffs, which is just not, just not enough to, for that really to stick. And so you, you'll never guess which theory was excluded altogether. I mean, you just, I mean I'll, really, I'll give you five guesses, but it turns out it's the Austrian theory was no mention at all. And, it's not, and again, I don't think it's because this particular professor was a, a sinister person and he thought, you know, my gosh, if I ever disclose to them what Hayek said about business cycles, my whole vision of society is going to collapse when these kids rise up. I don't think it was that. I think he just genuinely didn't know. So I thought, okay, do I have to become that creature I detest, the guy, the know-it-all in the back who raises his hand and corrects the professor? And meanwhile, everybody's going, look, we just want to hear his lecture so we can get out of here. But I thought, nope. The cause of truth demands that I put my hand in. <laughs> so I did, and I gave a very, very, very brief rudimentary overview of the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And, and he responded very generously, and he pointed out that you know, Hayek was a, a brilliant intellectual and so on and on. So that, that was fair enough. But he admitted to us, the reason I tell you this story is that he actually came right out and said, look, I don't have the training really to uh, discriminate between these theories. Like, I actually don't know. I, I, I don't know which one is the most persuasive, but I do know that this underconsumptionist one fits in the best with my own political outlook. I'll just come right out and tell you that. So that's why I tend to be most inclined to it. Mm. Well, I mean, look, he's honest. He told us that. So that's, that's, typical. that's what happens when you approach this stuff without the requisite knowledge or theory. You just say, well, I don't know what the heck's going on, so I'll pick the one that leads to Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, you know, and that leads to Barack Obama or whatever. I mean, like, you, your political prejudices become the deciding factor. So because we have this theory of the business cycle, when we look at major economic fluctuations, we're inclined to look for monetary causes. And, of course, given that money is half of every transaction in, in a modern economy, it's not, it's not unreasonable for us to be looking in that that area, that when we're looking at an economy-wide downturn, we're going to look for an economy-wide cause. And typically that's going to be the uh, interference with, with money and interest rates. And that reminds me, by the way, that if we have any budding historians or even economists who are interested in doing economic history, we really need some work on some of the, the 19th century financial panics in the U.S. Now, plenty of work has been done, but there's a lot more that can be done particularly on the recovery from these panics, but really, I mean, everything, the causes. Now, Rothbard did great service with his book, The Panic of 1819, and that book, I don't think you're going to improve on that, so I'd move on to another panic. <laughs> but, but he showed the way of how you can write a scholarly book. That was, that, his book on that subject, which came out in, I think, 1962, I think it was the same year as Man, Economy, and State, was published by Columbia University Press, and it was well received in the major historical journals. The American Historical Review thought it was a great book. And uh, now I don't know how they feel about his other works, but but it goes to show that you can write perfectly good work of economic history, one that in fact makes points that you would like to see made to to the broader society, uh, but without you know without bludgeoning people. I mean, you can just do it as a careful historian. So we need this very very badly. We have a lot of talk about. 19th century financial panics, but most people who talk about it really don't know anything about it. They know one sentence or something. So if, if we know more about this and we can give a compelling narrative about these things, it would be very, very helpful. So if you're interested in this, come talk to me, because I, I really want to get people cracking on this particular project. But also, so you, know, you understand what's causing these fluctuations, but you can also understand 
the recession or depression process itself and the role that it plays, the function that it plays, that this is technically not the bad thing, this is technically the good thing, this is where the, we have the, the necessary liquidations and the reallocations of resources. This is necessary to understand this if you're going to tell a story that makes sense. Also, if you understand that for the economy to recover, it is absolutely indispensably necessary for prices and wages to be able to fluctuate freely, well, again, you can tell a better story. If you, if, if you see that the recovery is not occurring, is it occurring sluggishly, well, you might be inclined to look around. Is there anything that might be impeding the movement of prices and wages? And so in the 1930s, you see there indeed is. I mean, numerous examples of this, and this has been documented by many, many people. I mean, I've written a little bit about it myself, but Tom DiLorenzo and any historian of Franklin Roosevelt can tell you about the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act and various things that did indeed interfere with the adjustment of prices and wages. So that you, you had, in the 1930s, you had extraordinarily high wages. People had very high wages. The problem was not that wages were low during the Depression. They were super high. That was the problem. People, people can't be employed uh, because of that. So we're inclined to look for these things. We're inclined to look for them because we recognize that something's not working the way it ought to. So we, we've got an understanding of how it ought to work, we, the, the, the smooth functioning that we come to expect from the natural order. When it is stymied in some way, we want to look for causes. There are a lot of historians who say, who actually just will come right out and say, just make clear what their presuppositions are by saying things like, Franklin Roosevelt needed to, to introduce program thus and so because he needed to increase the purchasing power of the average person. He needed to give people money so they could go out and buy stuff. So, of course, he had to push wages up. That's how the economy moves. People get higher wages than they can afford to buy, and everything, everything's super. Okay, but, you see, now, you won't tell that crazy story because you understand the problem with that. And just one problem with that is that, yeah, yeah you would have higher purchasing power, so-called, if you had more dollars, all, all other things equal, but the problem is the number of jobs offered at those wages will go down. So it's true, at a at million dollars an hour, everybody would have a lot of purchasing power. The problem is only two people will be employed. So there is, so there is that. I mean, but, and that's, that's, just the, and that's just scratching the surface, because I'm not, not here to, do, uh, to talk primarily about economics. But that's the sort of thing that the typical historian falls into all the time, thinking about underconsumption. You've got the, the mechanics necessary to show why that can't possibly be right. And therefore, you can render a sounder judgment on policies that are, in fact, impeding the natural adjustment of the economy by interfering with prices and wages or by spooking the market through constant innovations. This is not what businessmen want. Businessmen want stability from the political order. They, they don't want constant innovations. They don't want to be constantly badgered about how evil they are or to overhear that, in fact, uh, the president is arguing that 50 industrialists have, in fact, brought this upon us, and they are organizing against me. They are wicked and whatever. I mean, that's, you, you begin to think, this guy's deranged. Like, I mean, do I really want to expose my capital under a regime like this? This sort of thing helps you understand, why does, why does the Depression persist for so long? Is it really a purchasing power problem, or could it be a I'm terrified of this crazy regime problem? I mean, th these are the sorts of critical questions that you're more inclined to ask. Now, I also want to point out that Austrians are, uh, often talk about, uh, in, sort of in the spirit of, of Bastiat, contrary to fact scenarios. Now, this is not exclusive to Austrians, but of course, as we see immediately from praxeology, that the concept of cost comes in right at the beginning of the praxeological analysis, that if I do one thing, I can't do another. So th there's, a, there's a contrary to fact analysis going on right away. I, I'm, I'm doing this rather than that. So I can analyze this stream of events, but I, I can't analyze this one because it wasn't actually done, but I have, to con I have to conceive of it. I have to understand it. I have to think about it because it could have occurred had I used my resources differently. Well, for example, let's think about the, uh, the minimum wage issue. Now, there was that Card and Kruger study from uh, the 1990s that Walter Block had a field day with that tried to argue that uh, don't worry about the minimum wage. This is a... This is a big uh, boogeyman that economists have been dredging up for years. Turns out the minimum wage doesn't cause unemployment. It's not a big problem. You can raise the minimum wage and you don't have to worry about unemployment. It's just a whole hoax. It's, it's overstated and so on and so forth. 
Well, okay, there are a lot of technical problems with that study, but leaving aside the technical problems, what's interesting is even when you look at economists who claim to be free market positivists, that is to say they're not praxeologists, they, 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 everything's got to be subject to empirical testing. As Walter says, you scratch one of these positivists and underneath you find a praxeologist because when that study came out, we didn't have positivist free market economists saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe minimum wage doesn't cause unemployment. You know, maybe, maybe we have been wrong. You know, who knows? I guess I'll just have to read the study and see. They didn't say that at all. They immediately said, well, there's got to be something wrong with this study. So now, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you know that? How do you know that? So is it, is it, is it because you have a pre-existing understanding of the framework of the economy and how things work and You've got a non-empirical understanding that, you know, well, so anyway, you scratch it and you find that, that they're, they're actually in there. Um, or suppo let's suppose we, we, uh, we read that at some moment in the 19th century, half the New England textile industry had been destroyed in some horrific natural disaster. So supply falls dramatically. But we also read that in the wake of this disaster, the price of, of, of textiles remained the same. Would we be justified in concluding that supply has no effect on price? I mean, obviously, we would, we would know. Well, all right, there's got to be some offsetting factor uh, at, at work here. All right, now I want to move along because, as I said, I want to leave. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about some of the things that I've done in the past. I'll talk about other things. I mean, you know, of course, you can talk about evaluating public works programs uh, and, and, and so on and on. I mean, we're, we're more inclined to be skeptical of, of the value of those. Uh, because of contrary to fact scenarios, what if I hadn't built this this bridge? What if I had, what if the money had been available to be spent on other things? And even if we introduce the idle resources complication, um, we still win this argument. Um, but I want to move on to uh, Rothbard has this important article whose relevance for the historian may not be obvious right away, but which I think is a very important piece for historians, and that's a piece he wrote. Uh, and I, th I think it came out in the mid to either 55 or 56 toward a reconstruction of utility and welfare economics. Now you read it and it seems like you know, it's a technical overview of welfare economics, w which also, by the way, shows how steeped Rothbard was in the literature. Like he knew this stuff. He wasn't just some sniper with some you know, wise, wise guy, wise alecky comments to make at uh, you know, the great giants of the profession. He knew this stuff inside and out. But the key insight from this paper that's relevant for historians, and the relevance I'll, I'll indicate in a minute, is simply, is, of course, he's talking about sub subjective nature of value. You can't uh, compare, uh, you know, when you're talking about value, you can't compare across individuals like, uh, I like Mugu Gai Pan 3.7 times as much as you do. <laughs> I can't even say I like Mugu Gai Pan 3.7 times as much as I enjoy taking a walk. Like, I can't even say that about my own, my own preferences, much less compare them across people. So, so then if value is, is purely subjective, so how can we know objectively whether an economic exchange improves its participants' well-being? I mean, do, we, do we have to get into each person's head and, and, and experience that person's experiences to know? Well, his answer is, that now leaving, leaving aside the ex ante, ex post thing, his answer is that the very fact that the exchange occurs indicates that people are better off because they don't voluntarily enter into an exchange they expect not to benefit from. So the very fact of the existence of a voluntary exchange indicates that both parties have benefited because of the, uh, the fact that I, I value the thing I'm giving up less than the value of the thing I'm getting, and the other person has the, the opposite set of preferences. So this is demonstrated preference. I demonstrate this in action that I benefit and the corresponding person in the exchange likewise benefits from the exchange. Well, all right, well, this seems like an economic proposition. What can historians do with it? Well, First of all, this proposition has important uh, consequences for national income accounting. It has consequences, for example, in when we look at GDP, which has other problems too, but this is one of them. Uh, sometimes GDP figures are cited as a kind of shorthand, and sometimes they can function as a kind of shorthand for a country's economic well-being. But if voluntary exchanges are the only ones we can be sure are conferring a benefit, to, to both parties, but GDP is including government expenditures, and government expenditures do not involve this. Government expenditures involve coercion, and so this is not, there is no gain that, that's, that's occurring. Uh, is this a reliable indicator? I mean, obviously, I mean, the cr crudest example would be um, if the government's, the government's been buying hammers for $10 a hammer, and they start buying hammers for $10,000 a hammer, well, GDP will increase by 9990 
this year over, over last year? Uh, does that mean that our well-being has improved? Okay, so this is, this is why Rothbard suggests that if you really want to, either as a current events commentator or as a historian, trying to understand the economic condition of some country at some point in time, that you ought to discard this and consider instead uh, his own, his own uh, metric, which he called private product remaining. So he says that uh, government expenditures should be excluded from national income accounting because government spending constitutes a, a depredation upon rather than an addition to national product. And he writes, any person who believes that there is more than 50% waste in government will have to grant that our assumption is more realistic than the standard one. So in place of GDP figures, Rothbard proposes what he calls private product remaining, which he talks about in America's Great Depression. And he arrives at this, and this is just these are his own words, but first by deducting product or income originating in government and government enterprise, uh, uh, i.e. the payment of government salaries, from gross national product. This figure is the gross private product from which Rothbard then deducted the resources that government activity drained from the private sector, namely the larger of either government expenditures or receipts, to arrive at the private product remaining in private hands, or PPR. And so if economists want an idea of the American standard of living today, therefore, or if historians want to uncover its fluctuations over time, both groups are therefore much better served by calculating PPR per capita rather than following the Department of Commerce and its figures for per capita GDP. So insights like these can help the Austrian-influenced historian to avoid some of the kind of error that historians who lack this background have been so prone to commit. And among the most egregious of these is this idea that World War II was responsible for economic prosperity and lifting the United States out of the Great Depression simply because look at all the stuff we produce, look at the figures, look at the GDP figures, they're astonishing, they're just zooming up there, things must have been great. Um, well, okay, we have to think about this. First of all, there's the obvious point, contrary to fact scenarios, if we hadn't been building tanks, presumably you know, we, would have, we wouldn't have just been scratching our heads going, geez, what could we use these resources for? If we're not, not building tanks, I guess nothing. I mean, we would think of something to, to, to use it for. But, but beyond that, given that we, we're, we should be skeptical of these figures, we're inclined to look more closely at them and say, why are they so much more misleading during war than they, they normally are? And this is one of my favorite passages from Robert Higgs of all time, because it just absolutely obliterates this. I mean, it makes you wonder, how did people not see this? Why did it take until the 1990s before you know, scholars started to say, maybe World War II might have actually been a net loss for the economy? Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, here's Higgs. Consider that between 1940 and 1944, real GDP increased at an average annual rate of 13% a growth spurt wholly out of line with any experience before or since. Moreover, that extraordinary growth took place notwithstanding the movement of some 16 million men, which is equivalent to 28.6% of the labor force of 1940, into the armed forces at some time during the war and the replacement of those prime workers, mainly by teenagers, women with little or no previous experience in the labor market, and elderly men. So what Higgs wants to know is how could it be that we have record-setting growth at a time when we have this sudden and unprecedented resource constraint? The best workers are off getting shot at, and we've got a bunch of like old men and, and teenagers, no offense to you guys, but you know, you're not as good as people who are in their 30s who have been around for a while. Uh, you know, we've got all these people now suddenly, so the labor force has been seriously degraded, and that's when we get the best growth we've ever had? Well, if that were true, then maybe we should degrade the labor force even more. Let's break all our legs, right? <laughs> then the growth would be like 25%. So, so this is what he's saying. Is it plausible that an economy subject to such severe and abruptly imposed human resource constraints could generate a growth spurt far greater than any other in its entire history? And then he goes on, but I'll, um, you, should, you should read for yourself because uh, it's, it's very, very useful and rewarding. Well, then we realize what exactly the problem is, and it, and it comes back to some of these issues. You can't have meaningful, if you can have meaningful national product accounting at all, 
You certainly can't have it without market prices, because market prices reflect voluntary exchange. So again, Rothbard and, and uh, demonstrated preference. But in a command economy, and this is the heart of Higgs's argument, the fundamental accounting difficulty is that the authorities suppress and replace the only genuinely meaningful manifestation of people's valuations, namely free market prices. The prices that the U.S. government paid for the goods and services that it bought were essentially arbitrary and that they had no foundation in consumer choice. So the process by which the, the U.S. government bids on a, a tank uh, or, or th there's some kind of negotiation over a, a tank contract is completely different from the decision that you and I make you know, to buy a banana or something. It's, it's, not even, it's not even in the same universe. And so we can conclude that the greater that the, the government's coercive power becomes over the economy, the less meaningful, in terms of consumer welfare, its output statistics become. And the more of the economy that is placed in the command system by the government, the more tainted by arbitrariness do the output figures become. So at least two-fifths of national output was part of the war economy. And large classes of the remainder were in one form or another. There were spillover effects uh, into those. And so the result is you have a lot of prices that are completely arbitrary. And so then when you go to add up a whole bunch of arbitrary prices, what, what do you wind up with? A great big arbitrary number. So you have a bunch of little arbitrary ones, and then you wind up with a giant one. You say, wow, look at this. This is fantastic growth. We've never seen anything like it. Because that's why uh, Higgs says that the apparent super trend wartime boom in output was nothing but an artifact of an unjustifiable accounting system. And likewise, these very same figures would make you believe that 1946 was the worst year of economic performance in American history. Because it looks terrible, right? It just it goes right down. Well, because government spending is cut by about two-thirds, so the figures look terrible. But who the heck cares? Okay, so they're not building tanks. They're not killing people and everything else. But well, that's, a lot of people value not being shot at anymore. Like all the people who were drafted into the armed forces, they're glad they're not being shot at. They're happy to be home. But then secondly, look at the private economy, the economy of voluntary exchange. What's going on there? A 30% increase in output there. The biggest such jump ever, ever recorded in any one-year period in all of American history. But this has been totally missed, and this is why uh, Richard Vedder and Lowell Galloway wrote a sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, titled article the, uh, the, uh, about the Depression, the Great Depression of 1946. Well, there is no Great Depression of 1946. It's just that if you believe in these wartime statistics of super growth and fantastic progress, you have to, if you're going to live by those statistics, you're also going to have to perish by them. Because those statistics also tell you that 1946 was the worst year ever. I mean, how wrong, that's about as wrong as wrong can be. So ultimately, and so I think what I've done, I think I've been successful. I actually did keep, normally I go right up to the end. But ultimately, the use of theory in the study of history is not compromising the impartiality of the historian. I mean, Mises' point, and a point made by many Austrians, is that it's not like this is a choice you're faced with. Either I'm going to have a theoretical apparatus or I'm not. You can't do history without it. Rothbard says in America's Great Depression that you have to understand business cycles if you're going to write about them. He says gazing at sheafs of statistics with no theoretical apparatus is, is utterly futile. So no history worth reading can be written in the first place if, if the author divorces himself entirely from theory. And Austrian economics, in particular, provides the historian with a theoretical apparatus that equips him with the ability to make disembodied statistics tell a coherent an accurate story. All right, I have stopped early so as to get some uh, questions, but also comments and, and ideas of exciting historical topics you're working on so that I feel like the history profession is in good hands now. So, uh, yes? What is your opinion on Well, I, I actually think that's something you're, you're better suited asking the economists about. Because, uh, I mean, I'm, I... As a historian, I, I, I look at this and say, eh, you know, come on. I mean, I, this, but somebody who can give you more than just a grunt for an answer would be, uh, well, I think, well, again, I always point to Jeff, but we were just talking about this at lunch. Yeah, I mean, I think, because I think a lot of it is, uh, or at least a lot of times people will say, well, in my model, I can, I can do this or that. I can, I can play around with the data. I can fiddle with this and see what happens. But, you know, that might work for, 
Well, it, it doesn't work even for looking at the future, but the past occurred, so I, I, trying to model it isn't really all that helpful. I mean, I, I just want to know what actually happened, and I can't know that unless I understand just the fundamentals of how the world works. Like, I have to go into this with that understanding, or otherwise you get the typical American history textbook, which is written by somebody who is not an economic historian and so doesn't have any of the appropriate intellectual tools and simply... When he gets to the economic stuff, just looks at what the consensus is and just repeats it. Uh, let's see, I've got, uh, I saw this gentleman first and then, then back here. Oh, sure. Uh, history, okay. Oh, okay, so in other words, uh, how do I feel? Like, is 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 there any merit, any any value in so-called counterfactual history? Well, I mean, just as as a kind of an innocent pastime, you know, as a as a pleasurable thing, you know, what would have happened if so and so side had won this war and this one hadn't, and whatever? What if there had been no Peloponnesian War? What would have happened to the Greeks? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, there's nothing scientific about it, but if you know, if it floats your boat, I got no objection to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's just that when I hear counterfactual history, I'm always thinking about the books like, what if the South had won the Civil no, War? Yeah. Books, right. Um, right. Well, I mean, in a way, we're implicitly doing counterfactual history when we say that the Depression wouldn't have been as severe if they hadn't done the following seven things, right? I mean, that's at least implicitly. We might, we not, might not package it that way. But that's implicitly what it is. We're saying we'd have a better world if we hadn't had these blockheads doing all these things to us, right? So, I mean, I think that's almost implied in, in uh, certainly in all the economic history I've done, is, is suggesting that we would all have been better off, uh, you know, under a different policy regime. Okay, I saw this uh, gentleman next. Um, well, they won't be as good as Austrian economic historians, but they'll still, well, I mean, no, I mean I'm just, but, but seriously, but, um, but you can still learn from them. I mean, you could, you can learn from uh, somebody like, I mean, you can learn from some of the work of Douglas North. You can learn from uh, David Landis. I mean, that sometimes they say things that infuriate me, but, but you know, they, they've got uh, you know, useful things to say. There's um, Ralph Rako has an essay called, uh, well, on the, on the European miracle. In fact, I was recommending it to somebody. And then I found it online on Mises. Because at first I was saying, well, it's, this, it's in this old edited collection from NYU from the early 90s. And so we went to the library and we got it. We were going to go photocopy it. And I thought, whoa, my gosh, what am I living in 1993? What am I doing here? I went online and sure enough, there's the whole essay right there. And in that essay, Reiko goes through and basically gives you a survey of of the really good economic historians who have tried to answer the question, why was Europe, why did Europe, Western Europe have such success in achieving sustained economic growth over an extended period of time for the first time, you know, anywhere? Like, why did this happen there? What were the unique set of circumstances? And there are a lot of historians whom, whom I've quoted and cited, but they're all in this essay, in the notes. So, so, you know, and, and Reiko sort of synthesizes them and pulls out what's what's useful from. Them. So I, I can't remember the name, but if you do, in quotation marks, Ralph Reiko, and then separate quotation marks, a European miracle, you'll find this essay. But but we should talk about this over dinner because there are there are a whole bunch of economic historians that I've I feel like I've benefited from, even though they've been not entirely right, and even even some some of the some of the work that's even in the the Milton Friedman. Um, monetary history, some of that's perfectly fine, and the Depression stuff isn't very good, but some of the 19th century stuff is okay. Uh, yeah, 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 because yeah, there, there, there are plenty of people I've, I've learned from, and they, they either give me raw data or they help me think about things, and, and, they, and, and people who, by and large, come out right, more or less, you know, I think, reaching the correct conclusion. Uh, um, yes. Yes, you. Okay, uh, I have a comment because the same epoch, the same, uh, if you look at the GDP statistics of post communist countries at the period of transition, I mean, between the 80s and 90s, you will see the same epoch as you uh, described during the Second World War. 
Is it the st- so? Is it because is it because the state is shrinking? Is it, yeah. Okay. I, I just remembered. I'm supposed to repeat the questions because of the the, the poor souls downstairs. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, yeah. This gentleman just had the comment that we see the same sort of phenomenon in the statistics at a time when the when uh, Eastern European co- countries are moving away from communism, and so the the parasitic sector shrinks. And so the GDP, I don't want to call it public sector. I like to you know, really stick it to them. But it, sh- it's, it shrinks, and so with it, these statistics shrink. And so you think, oh, my goodness, what a terrible development this is. No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting shot at anymore. Same sort of principle, isn't it? I'm not getting shot at anymore. Okay, were there other ones? Uh, yes? Yeah, my question relates to uh, the history of World War II and the Depression. And uh, my question is, after World War II... The, everything besides the United States in terms of productive capacity, the industrial center in, New, in, uh, in Europe was destroyed. Right. And how did the comparative advantage in America and the, to the relation of the rest of the world affect recovery and um, growth and everything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, the argument uh, that, uh, that the war contributed to U.S. economic recovery is because sometimes I hear this sort of objection that well, but but didn't it actually help economic recovery? Because after all, the U.S. is like the last man standing, and so surely that has to help. But that but the the argument that they're making is actually just that the spending, the, just the, the the bringing all these idle resources into production, that's what did it, and that's the thing that I'm disputing. Uh, well, yeah, I mean certainly that relatively speaking, you know, the the, the U.S. Uh, you know is is in an extremely enviable position at the end of the war, but. Of course, it would have been better for everybody concerned, for Americans too, if there had also been, uh, if, 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 if European productive capacity had not been degraded, because then Americans would, would still be, would be better off. But, but certainly, relatively speaking, obviously, they'll, they'll, they'll gain. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh. Uh, Mark, pick somebody. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Let's see. Uh, okay. He, he doesn't want to get unpopular. Oh, okay. You raised two hands. That was really gutsy. <laughs> All right. All right. There's a model for all of us. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I understand the exact pressures that uh, I specifically am under when you have this impartiality stuff. I mean, I've had to uh, sift through Butterfield's weird interpretation and explain why he's right and, uh, and have debates on it and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, on a, and my question is, I've actually uh, I've read uh, Charles Sellers' Micro-Revolution. Yeah, kind of a weird uh, book. But. Yeah, Blood and Horns, uh, A History of Banking in Antebellum, in Antebellum America. And uh, Blood and Horns' book is you know, a, thorough, a thorough work in, in statistics, and, uh, and, he, and he admits it. Um, but the, the conclusions he draws, while, while they're not, you know, like... The, Nothing fancy, but it's more like, oh, was it more of a demand following or a uh, model or a supply, you know, uh, a supply creating uh, and then demand following from the supply? These kind of arguments, he doesn't really draw any concrete conclusions, but I feel like he at least uh, tries to do a nice objective job of, you know, at least explaining what was going on. And in, in, in the end, the conclusion that he draws to is that this, uh, uh, I guess we call free banking kind of uh, era. Uh, prior to the Civil War, did actually work for most things. Yeah, yeah, that's... I'm wondering if you would, uh, if you would so, if you, I'm sure you would mostly agree with that, but I mean, can you can use statistics to get, to, to arrive at the same Yeah, well, I mean, also you can, but I mean, you can use some sort of, of simple techniques. I mean, you can, uh, in fact, you can even just look, they, you can find records where they actually kept registers in order to keep track of all the different banknotes that were circulating. There would be registers that you could you could actually consult because typically in your local area you're going to see the same currencies, but may, maybe a new note could come down. And how do you evaluate this? And and you would actually see how far from par each each note was being accepted. So they even in those primitive conditions they were able to sort of throw things put things together and 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 make this all work. 
but yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm glad to hear that. I'm actually not familiar with that work, but I'm glad to hear that. That actually reminds me to, that I, I want to point out that I think it's easier for historians to do work that is sort of Austrian-inspired, maybe even than it is for economists to do that work, because historians are not as acutely aware of the, uh, the, the sort of school-based rivalries. Like Most historians don't even know what the Austrian school is. And so, I mean, there are a lot of PhD advisors who would just think that you're doing very interesting work. Like, you can, you can get away with this, and it's, it's perfectly fine. So it's, it's, uh, it's easier to do that. All right, do we have time for one? We're going to do one more? Okay, yes. Professor, are you, are you, gonna use, or are you using the libertarian theory of imperialism to explain world history, let's say, like the Robotian uh, theory or the Hopperian theory of imperialism to explain world history? Are you going to use that in any project? Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so do I? Am I looking? Am I looking to uh, what I consider a project that involves using a Rothbardian, Hoppian view of imperialism to to uh, as a lens through which to understand the world history? That sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I say that not to diminish it, but that I, I hope some young whippersnapper tries something like that. I mean, Hoppe has really paved the way for that sort of thing by by making the point that. The very liberalism that makes wealth creation possible in a particular country also then equips the government of that country with the military wherewithal to go and you know bluster all around the world, and so sometimes it's the it's the very liberal country, liberal in the traditional sense, that becomes the most militarily aggressive. Well, that's it's, it's another one of these insights that's just the opposite of what you might think, but that once you hear it stated. It, uh, it seems to have some explanatory power. L let me, I think we're, we're just about out of time, but I want to uh, close with sort of an appeal to the, some of the folks here. After the, the Mises Circle thing is over and we're all out socializing, I could really benefit. I'm, I'm working on something now where I'm working on a book that is going to be a chapter on the, the war on drugs. And I know a little something about this, but this is not really an area I've written about, and I'm trying to read as much about it as I possibly can. So any of you who have read or written on this or do feel sort of knowledgeable about this, who I could just throw, pelt a few questions at you. If you could maybe just seek me out, some, some out somewhere out there, you know, near the alcohol uh, afterward. <laughs> no, but I, honestly, I would really appreciate that because I, I would like to benefit from the knowledge that you guys have here. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs>